In the old days, we had to participate for our co-op to exist. And it's interesting with startup co-ops, the old days are kind of this year or last year, you know, where you're actually starting the co-op, you're involved in the operations, and participation is pretty clear because without doing that, the co-op's not going to exist. When I started my first job in a co-op, there was two employees. All the work was done by volunteers, essentially member volunteers. And it was fabulous in a way. We had people that would come at 5 a.m., drive the truck 45 minutes to the state farmer's market every morning and bring back the produce f for the day. As things evolved to today, in most cases, our member participation is not needed for the co-op to operate in the day-to-day -day activity. So it really raises the question, how has member participation changed to today? And in that pyramid that a lot of us have seen about different types of participations that relate to different member interests, my sense is that the participation happens at the very top of the pyramid and at the very bottom of the pyramid today. And at the top, it's I vote for the board, I come to the annual meeting, maybe I'm on the board, and at the very bottom, I shop. And that is not a very strong pyramid, and I think that's the gap. The gap in the middle is really what we're talking about, because what I observe is at the top of the pyramid, not enough people vote in elections, not enough people come to the annual meeting, and as boards, we spend a lot of time beating ourselves up about how we're not doing a good job. Or we may create heroic efforts where the members vote on expansion, for example, sort of as a response to that. Well, we're not doing enough participation, so now members need to vote on everything. So I, th I think we need to recognize maybe we need to stop some of that, at least think about it, and think about what other types of participation. And then I think at the very bottom, we have this general concept that our members like us and participate by shopping. And the corollary to that is when the Whole Foods opens up and they stop shopping is that they don't like us. And often our response to that is what I call the guilt postcard. I just got one this week from <laughs> Co-op in North Carolina. And basically it says, our co-op to stay in existence needs you to support us. This one, it wasn't even a very good guilt postcard because it really didn't tell me what to do. It didn't really say shop more. It just kind of said support us. And, you know, ha having sent out that postcard before, I'm not <laughs> proud of it, but I think we've been there. And I think that's just an example of we don't have that space in the middle. So in the future, let's think about other types of participation, and I can think of four. And I think the first one, which is kind of a prerequisite, is that we're telling the story in which the co-op is the hero. That is our story, that's what we're doing, that's our goals, and how we're making a difference in the world. But I think we need to consciously tell that story because we need to get people's attention. The co-op needs to be more to them than just the place that I shop. That's kind of a prerequisite. I think once we have that and we have goals that are shared to some extent, there's a lot of practical ways that people participate in accomplishing the co-op's goals. Some of them are around packaging, for example, because all of us feel terrible about the amount of packaging we use. And as consumers, we don't like to get that amount of packaging, but we haven't developed this hand and glove relationship where we just figure it, figure it out. So there's the checkout bag issue about, you know, there's paper and there's plastic, which we both hate because they're both terrible for the environment, but not everybody remembers their bag. So how are we going to deal with that very simple issue? And I think that's, that's participation, right? Because if everybody brings their bags. And it works. And so we're thinking about that issue, struggling with it, fighting it. But we pretty much decided that our approach is going to be 
we're just going to have reusable bags, and if you forgot your bag, we're going to give you another bag. And if you want to bring it back, that's fine. If you don't want to bring it back, that's fine. But we're just going to go cold turkey. There's no more disposable bags. A couple of other practical things is that if, if my goal is to purchase more local from the co-op as a customer, how am I getting the feedback from the co-op about how, how am I doing? How are we using our point of sale system to put that information on the register or add it to the dividend mailing at the end of the year about how did I rank and did I buy more than last year and collectively how is our co-op doing based on my participation. Um, there's also getting feedback just about fun stuff. Like we're having our 25th anniversary and we're getting six local breweries to brew us a special beer. That's what people want to talk about. We, we got more feedback on what kind of beer it should be <laughs> by far than anything else. You know, it's, a, it's silly, but people are interested in that. So, you know, we can engage on that level too. And, you know, in England, they use the super dividend concept where you actually get more of a patronage dividend based on the behaviors that the co-op has identified as beneficial. So, you know, if you you know, recycle more or buy local more, whatever it is, you know, we can think of ways to reward that. So that's one level we can engage in is more just sort of practical hand and glove relationships. A second way is what we've started to call co-op sourcing, kind of crowdsourcing, kind of it's the Wikipedia idea, but how do we get the intellectual help of our community in an organized Way. So how is the university using its intellectual sort of resources to help solve our particular problems? And there's lots of stuff, like just, uh, I was talking today that Rusty, to, who's here today, just in, in side conversation told me about self-insurance. And our co-op has saved a few hundred thousand dollars in the last three years based on that one conversation. So how many conversations like that happen, and I think it's not, some of that just happens by chance, but I think some of it happens by we have our identified goals and we think strategically about who out there in the community can help solve this um, problem. Um, the third area is financial participation. I think this one is huge. You know, we're all thinking about our projects and our member loan programs, and I think that's good. I think that that's advanced quite a bit, but I think it's just the tip of the iceberg when you think about how much money we are investing collectively in things that we don't believe in. You know, a new law just passed about crowdfunding, and so there's going to be new mechanisms to do that, and I think we can find chunks of investment that aren't the five or ten thousand dollar member loans but are like the five hundred dollars or the one hundred dollar investments that can be done you know electronically and efficiently and we can be realistically one hundred percent owner financed in our projects moving forward and then the final one and i think this one is really huge and it it really gets under my skin is that there is a global tax of about 2% on all the transactions that go to the biggest banks in the world. So talk about a system for perpetualizing the concentration of ownership and capital in the world, and that is the credit card system. And we need to go get out of that system completely. I know for our co-op, if you look at non-payroll expenses, just operational expenses in the store, that amounts to about 20% of our expenses. It amounts to almost a million dollars a year, almost the same as our profit for the year. So basically we give half of the profits back to the members and half of it to Citibank, et cetera. And there exists out there today alternatives to that and that we should be doing that. And if, if we decide to do it as a co-op and we decide to do it as a member, then we don't have to sue the credit card companies and fight for the little bit that they're going to stop um, gouging us on. We can just say, 
go ahead and do that. You know, we as cooperators do it a different way. So those are some examples of this sort of middle ground of participation. And if you look at the, the um, blueprint for the co-op decade, that's what it's talking about. And the problem with the blueprint is it's really not a blueprint. It's sort of an outline of the issues. So that's where it really comes to us is to fill in those details about what is this next generation of participation. And I think that there's a lot of energy out there that we're not capturing. And we can get people's attention and get their participation by telling the bigger story and then giving them concrete, immediate steps that they can take. Because the problem, and this is, I think, why the Occupy movement you know, was really exciting, but then it stopped, is there, wasn't, there was the excitement, but there wasn't those concrete next steps that everybody could take. And I think that's where we're, we're, we're positioned to do that. We are the blank that people are trying to, to fill in about what the next step. So let's capture that. And I think that's what's going to make participation a competitive advantage for co-ops going forward. Thanks.